<laughs> All right, we'll wait about another minute and then we'll get started. Yeah. What time are they coming? Huh? What time are they coming? What time are they no, I don't. I just did it three times and never got three times. It muted, um, unmuted him and. Hi, Rabbi Weiss. Hi, Rebecca Linger. How are you? I was so sorry to hear about Susie's mother. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, I think uh, we are going to get started. So I'm going to ask um, Yassi, who is a very gracious host. He's going to uh, mute everybody. And this is streaming live on YouTube. And you know, anytime you miss a share, uh, you can, it's easy to find the link to it. You can either just Google YouTube with my name or um, go into the Ohelari website which also has a library. And if you look at the Parsha sheet, I always indicate there at the top, the link to that library. So um, welcome to everybody. Hope you're all staying safe. Some of you have gotten your first, your second shots. A few Overeager people got their third shot. So just kidding. And everybody should uh, stay healthy. I want to... Um, dedicate this year to Susie's mother, Zichrona Livracha, who passed away two days ago, Leah Klein, Rachelea Bat Avraham Visara, uh, representing almost the, na the names of almost all the Avot and Imahot. She was a very unique person. She was a survivor of the Holocaust. She, uh, quote unquote, celebrated her 16th birthday in Auschwitz. She and her sister presented before Mengele, Yemach Shmo Vezichrono, um, saying that they were twins in the hopes that they would both be saved. Um, thank God they avoided uh, any repercussions of that. And they both did survive the camps and went on, both of them, to uh, long lives, Baruch Hashem mostly in Cleveland, and my mother-in-law made Aliyah 10 years ago. She came to Ranana, Ir HaKodesh, and was one of the oldest people ever, not the, but one of the oldest, on Nefesh B'Nefesh, and they gave her a seat of honor on the plane when she came over, and she was a very beautiful, vivacious person. I wanted to show you, if we can see it, just a picture, a picture of her. Um, and you can see that uh, she really, truly was a beautiful person um, and always the life of the party, uh, married for 60 years to my father-in-law. And in general, uh, she was no shrinking violet, um, much like my darling wife, Susie. And I think that she really, in Later years, she opened up and began to speak publicly about her experiences in the Shoah, always to rave reviews from different groups uh, when she spoke. And we were happy to have her with us in Israel for the last 10 years of her life. So I will do a little something else regarding her at the end of the year. So stick around for that if you can. I also want to mention, and I'll repeat this later, because Mincha Marv is getting later, we are going to move the time next week to from 5.45 to 6.15. I hope this will not inconvenience anybody. We'll still try to keep it sweet and short, <coughs> always trying to be around a half hour. And um, this will allow us to make room for Mincha Marv. You know, we are sharing the Zoom room with uh, Ohel Ari. So that's where they do their Mincha Marv on Zoom. So we have to leave a plenty of time. So 
first of all, there was a question at the end of last week's share, which I said I would answer, and that it's an interesting idea why we don't pronounce the name of Hashem. We talked about that subject last week, the many names of God, but we do not pronounce the name of Hashem as it appears in print. This is primarily learned from the word when Hashem says, Zeshmi le'olam, skipping the letter Vav in the word le'olam. So instead of it meaning, this is my name forever, it can be read, this is my name as it is hidden. Not le'olam, but le'alem. And the Medrash learns from there that Hashem said to Moshe, right from the very beginning, that you are not to pronounce my name as it's written. Instead, you'll pronounce it as we do um, when we say the name in davening, Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud. And then we use the nickname for it when we just want to say the name, Hashem. The reason for this is not completely clear, but one of the reasons given is a very practical, simple reason that you show respect for people sometimes when you don't use their first name, right? We try to discourage young children, especially in already in kindergarten, calling their teachers by their first name. You, when you want to show a, a higher level of respect, there are certain people that you don't call by their first name and you give them a title. And this is Hashem's title, which means, you know, Hashem or Adoshem, right? It means like master or someone who is in command. And therefore, from the very beginning, Hashem's name was not pronounced the way that it's spelled. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, I want to move on. This is the Parsha of Miracles. There's the majority of the Eser Makot of the 10 plagues are in this week's Parsha. And I want to discuss a little bit about the significance of miracles and what these makot were really all about. We know them. We know them from the Haggadah. And most of us, you know, have seen some of the movies that show graphically these 10 plagues. Uh, and I want to try to take a bit uh, of a deeper look at them. The first and... and Let's start off, as we always do, with a question. And the question is, why 10 plagues? Could God not have accomplished what he wished to, which is extricating the Jews from, we'll call them Jews, even though they were then known not as Jews, but as either Hebrews or Israelites. So pick a name, but we'll call them Jews just for argument's sake. And clearly Hashem could have taken them out of Egypt with one plague. There's no reason that doesn't seem that he had to, to engage in this kind of overkill of 10 plagues. So there must be a reason for it. And the Mephoshim are full of different reasons. We, first of all, they love the letter 10, right? You know, with the, obviously the 10 commandments and, and it being just, you know, one of those great round numbers that are easy to remember and talking about the world being created with 10 ma'amarot, God saying, you know, let there be, let there be light, right? Let the earth give forth vegetation. And so here too, um, that Hashem is, is changing the world and changing history with 10 utterances. I, I want to explore that a little bit deeper because obviously there must be a reason why Hashem is engaging in all these different plagues. So I want to suggest when we ask the question, a question on a question, of course, we have to always ask questions on questions, that who are the plagues directed towards? For whose benefit are the Eser Makot? So I think you can really sum that up and then say that there are three primary um, subjects to the Eser Makot. The first is that we are directing them towards Egypt. That's the simplest answer because they are the ones who are impacted the most, it seems, right? So we are, Hashem is delivering these 10 plagues as a punishment or seeking justice 
for what the Egyptians did to us. And there's a parallel to everything, you know, that happens in these 10 plagues that are mida connected, mida, measure for measure, against what the Egyptians did to us. You take the first plague, for example, of the water turning into blood. So obviously blood represents, uh, is a symbol for violence or murder. Uh, the, 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 the Chazal say that uh, Paro would bathe in the blood of Jewish children, thinking that uh, this was, you know, a, a cure-all or, or a kind of fountain of youth, etc. All kinds of reasons given. And so the first plague, the first Maka, is blood, turning the Nile into blood, and so on and so forth, that this was done as a way of punishing Paro, and therefore the uh, some of the Mefarshim look at the plagues as a kind of military strategy versus the Egyptians in order to ultimately wear them down and bring them to where they will allow the Jews to leave. And you can see, for example, just as an army fights on land, sea, and air, so too the makot take place on land, sea, and air, right? We have makot that happen on the land, right? Where uh, against uh, vegetation and um, the lice that come out of the ground. You have those that come from the water, as we said, the, the plague of blood, right? Um, also the frogs come out of the water, and then you have those that are airborne, like the hail, for example, or the locusts that come out of the air. So it's a kind of military maneuver, land, sea, and air against Paro. So that's one aspect of the Makot. They're directed against the Egyptians, either in punishment for what they did or a way of defeating them to the point where they are willing to let the Jews leave. The second possibility is that they are really not just for Egypt, but they are designed uh, and directed towards the entire world. That is that Hashem is using this platform in modern language as a way of demonstrating his superiority over, the, over nature, over history, and specifically against the gods of Egypt. So some of the makot are directed specifically, as some of the Mephorshim say, each of the 10 plagues was directed against another one of Egypt's gods because they had a, a lot of gods. They were very idolatrous. So the first plague, for example, against the Nile, because the Egyptians considered the Nile a god in and of itself. It led to the prosperity or the lack of prosperity for the Egyptians and Paro uh, liked to say that it was a god, but he had control over that god. That's why he, he would go to the Nile each day to bathe or to relieve himself, but also to pronounce, you know, I control the Nile and whatever it does. The plague, for example, of uh, Choshech, of darkness, was directed against the Egyptian god Ra. Anyone who does crossword puzzles know, knows that name Ra, R-A right? Because it fills in sometimes. And so the, the, the god of the sun, Ra, is blotted out by the Choshech. And this is uh, God showing his mastery over the universe because the end game, let's, let's understand that the end game of this whole Egyptian experience is ultimately to get Paro, who is arguably the leader of the known world, to pronounce, yes, there is a God, and that God rules over all other forces in the universe, because Hashem wishes that his name will be, we say every day, three, you know, Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad, his name is one, meaning that every person, every country, every culture will acknowledge that there is a God. This is what Hashem wants to accomplish. He wants there to be a universal acceptance and acquiescence to the supremacy of Hashem, of God. So these plagues are there in order to impress the world. 
uh, as to the existence and the power of Hashem. And then there is a third possibility, not Egypt, not the world, but directed, or let's say specifically for the benefit of the Jewish people, that all of these plagues are designed uh, purposefully in order to help Am Yisrael. How so? Well, let, let's look at a pasuk in the beginning of this parsha. Also a question, which is going to lead us to answer the other questions. Already in the beginning, when Hashem speaks to Moshe, and he says to him, <laughs> it's an interesting pasuk, by the bear Elohim el Moshe, vayomer elav ani Hashem. So here he's inter, you know, he's he's mixing two names. The God of Justice is actually saying to Moshe, because we know Elohim is the God of Justice. He's saying, "I am Hashem," meaning I am also the God of mercy. So, in other words, there's there's going to be justice meted out, but it's justice in the cause of mercy and compassion. Justice versus the Egyptians who wronged us, but ultimately designed as an act of mercy to the Jewish people. And then he says, when he tells Moshe, "Here's what I want the speech I want you to deliver. What I want you to do: and more leave Ne Israel and Yeshem." Tell B'nai Israel, I am God. And I will take them out from under the Sivlot of Mitzrayim. We'll translate that in a moment. Students of the text, which we all should be, pay attention. Because in the very next part, and then he says, we have these expressions of Geula that we all know, right? Because of the four cups of wine that we drink at the Seder. We know the Arba Lashonot Geula, which are here in this Pasuk. And the next, and then in the following pasuk, as he finishes the four expressions, and he says, He repeats this phrase. Now, again, something our, our, our spiritual antenna are tingling. When we see this is an unusual expression, he repeats it in two successive psukim. Something must be up with that expression. And the key word there, of course, is because we, it's not mitachat, it's not mitzrayim, it's sivlot. What does the word sivlot mean? So it's usually translated to mean the burdens. I will take you out, says God to Moshe, from, I will take the people out from the burden of Egypt that they are suffering under. Obviously, they're working very hard. They're carrying things, whether they built the pyramids or not, which is the subject of a lot of, uh, you know, historic debate. But they were certainly doing a lot of heavy labor. We know that for sure. They were building cities. It says they built Pitom, they built Ramses, Ramses. So the simple explanation is, I will take them out from under this burden. In other words, I will relieve them of this great burden they are suffering with in Egypt. Okay, but the fact that it's repeated twice leads some of the commentators to have a different explanation or an additional explanation. Mitachat sivlot mitzrayim. The word sivlot can it can indeed be connected to sevel, which is burden, but it can also be connected to other another word we know, either savlanut or better sovlanut, same root. Sovlanut means tolerance. And what Hashem is saying to Moshe is, I want you to take the Jewish people out and extricate them from the tolerance, from the fact that they tolerate what's going on, what, what's being done to them. You know, this is a syndrome that dates all the way back to Egypt. We're familiar with it. Dr. Viktor Frankl in his Logotherapy talks about it, about people who come to uh, tolerate every kind of degradation and injustice done to them. He writes, uh, you know, in his, in his famous, in Frankl's famous work, he writes that there were people in the, in the death camps, in the concentration camps, who would take little sticks and they would 
uh, break them so they could form the letters SS, imitating and putting on their shoulder what the SS officers wore on their uniform, a way almost of connecting with the people who were persecuting and terribly oppressing them. And you see this syndrome in so many different places, you know, in South Africa, where, where people would say, I don't necessarily want to end this apartheid. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a syndrome that I once called, um, I've grown accustomed to your mace. <laughs> in other words, you know, you're beating me, you're hurting me, but I don't want to, I, I, I've learned to live with it. I don't want somebody coming and changing the equation and upsetting the apple cart and making waves because I've learned to, to live with this. And Hashem is saying to Moshe, you've got to break that. You've got to make Am Yisrael understand that there's, they're, they're above this, that if anyone should not be mistreated, it's them. They're a royal people. You've got to raise them up from the slave mentality where they're almost, you know, uh, uh, apologizing for who they are and fully accepting all of the punishments and degradation that's heaped on them. In short, you've got to raise their self-esteem. This is the key. And this is what I suggest to you is one of the main, if not the main thrust of the Makot. It's an attempt to raise the self-esteem of this large, up to 2 million group of people who once were the nobles and princes, and now they've been reduced to slaves. And they cannot think of themselves that way. They've got to recapture the essence of what it means to be a Jew, which is to be a royal person, which is to be Hashem's firstborn, Am Segula, chosen people. Somehow that's gotten lost in the mix. And that's why a lot of things begin to make sense. I talk about this in the Parsha sheet, but just as, as another, in a different way. But you see right after this speech that God gives near the beginning, suddenly we have an, a break where we devote um, about 15 psukim, 15, 17 psukim, going into the genealogy of the tribes of Israel. All of a sudden, in as my mother-in-law would say, in the Mitten Durinum, out of left field, Ela Rashe, Beit Abutam, B'nei Ruvain, B'nei Shimon. What are we doing here? We, first of all, we did this already, right? We did this at, at the beginning of Shemot. We talked about names. Why are we interjecting this? I suggest that the reason we're doing this in Hashem is reminding Moshe, we weren't always slaves. We come from a royal background. We come from the Shvatim. We're talking about Yehuda and Yosef and Levi and Yaakov. We're, we're not just an ordinary people. We are a princely nation. And that's why these genealogical sukim are thrown into the mix. These four expressions of Geula, they are stages. Because God knows that in order to raise people up, it can't be done in one fell swoop. You know this about people who are alcoholics, right? As just an example, there's always steps to take, whether it's 10 steps or 12 steps. There's a program that gradually takes you from a low place to a high place, from a state of some kind of uh, malady, some kind of um, obsession or addiction to a much better place. It can't be done all at once. So the four expressions are not just four different ways of saying the same thing. They're not. They're different stages of redemption. The first is you know, to, uh, to actually stop the slavery. The second is 
to bring the people um, out of, to take the people out of Egypt. The third step is at the Yamsuf, when the danger, the threat of Egypt is eliminated, when the sea splits and destroys the Egyptian army. And the fourth step of liberation is getting the Torah at Har Sinai. <clears throat> there is a fifth step, of course, which I won't go into, which is another topic, maybe next year. And that is the fifth step, which the fifth expression, which is the Heveti et Chem el Haaretz asher nasati et yadi latet lavra miyaskakul Yaakov, the fifth step of redemption, which we in our generation are meriting to experience is coming to Israel because you can't be completely free in another country. You can only be truly liberated no matter what people think with all due respect to people tuning in from all different kinds of places. You can only really be completely free and liberated in your own country. And so that is the fifth cup or the fifth step, which is a whole other topic. The same idea of a gradual a uh, transformation from slave to sovereign is coming through the Eser Makot. It can't come immediately. It takes time. So step after step, time after time, God is showing to Am Yisrael, look what I am doing on your behalf. I'm intervening in history. I'm changing nature. I'm bending science with all kinds of things that never happened before. I'm, I'm turning one, I'm turning, you know, vegetable into animal, animal into mineral. I'm, I'm, I'm causing hail, which is fire and ice combining in one. I mean, all of these things are being done because at first people won't believe it. When you have a low self-esteem, you can't just give somebody a speech and then in one fell swoop, oh, they automatically become confident people, sure of themselves, filled with this, with this self-esteem. No, it takes time. You have to do it step by step by step to continually show them and prove to them, look who you are. You are a people who merit divine intervention that Hashem watches, Ene Hashem Elokecha, not only the eyes of God are not only on Israel, but they're on each one of you. You're special. You're not a slave. You are a royal person. You're a prince, a princess. And, and this is, um, this is a, a struggle that we will go through all throughout our time in the desert and continually. As they say, you can take the slave out of Egypt, but it's harder to take the, the you can take this, but it's harder to take the Egypt out of the slave, etc. You can take the Jews out of Egypt, but taking the Egypt out of the Jews, that's much more difficult. Sorry, I didn't get there right the first time. Um, but you see, this is uh, the fundamental problem we have in any of the sins or any of the challenges and any of the um, downfalls of our people throughout the Torah. When you talk about the golden calf, we'll, we'll talk about these perhaps in, in more detail when we come there, but when we talk about the golden calf, it's because the people didn't have enough self-esteem to think that they could connect to Hashem themselves, that they needed some kind of middleman or middle object or some kind of intercessor for them because they weren't of a level to have a relationship themselves with Hashem. That's lack of self-esteem. When the Miraglim come and they say, no, we can't conquer Israel. Uh, and, you know, we, in our eyes, we look like grasshoppers. That's the lack of self-esteem. And even the sin of Baal Peor, this terrible eschatological uh, type of uh, worship and in all kinds of perverse forms. Again, it's people thinking, well, I'm not capable of being a uh, upstanding and truly great moral person. And Moshe is told from the beginning, that's your challenge. You have to somehow move them from where they are now 
to essentially where they used to be in the days of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and to where they ultimately are going to have to be when they come into their own country. Because if you don't have faith in yourself and you don't have a self-esteem that says, I am a person worthy of the gifts that God wants to give me, then you'll always fall. You have to be careful not to let it go to your head. Like any trait, you know, every trait uh, has its extreme. And we've talked about that, you know, wh whether it's charity or love or chesed, even those wonderful things, you have to be careful about taking them to an extreme. So you don't want to have extreme self-esteem that says, that I, that I accomplished everything, that I am perfect, that I have no faults. You don't want to do that. But you, you want to move people to where they say, um, I, I am, you know, Bishvili Nivraha Olam. Because of me, God created this world. I, I am indeed something special. And only such a person can evoke the mirrors and the protection of Hashem. And that is the, the great challenge that Moshe Rabbeinu is given. So this phrase, mitachat sivlot mitzrayim, we come back to that. Yes, take them out of the burden of Egypt, but also take them out of this state of tolerance where they have uh, accepted being treated like a slave. They are not a slave. And you have to drum that into their heads and it will take 10 times. And I want to add finally that the parallel to our own day, and I've written about this, but I, but if, but I want to reiterate it, that, that we've seen this in our own times. When we emerged from, and so I come back to, to my mother-in-law, Zichrona Libracha, when you come out of the Shoah, we were at the lowest point, maybe ever, the degradation we suffered. We were made into slaves, slave labor. My father-in-law was also in a slave labor camp. And we were completely degraded. And maybe we would have looked at ourselves and said, you know, who are we? We're at the bottom rung of the social ladder. We've been reduced to ashes, to almost nothing. But Hashem comes and says, you know what? I'm going to show you in a kind of replay of these 10 plagues. I'm going to bring you back to a certain sense of self-esteem. So what happens when we come to Israel? We emerge from the death camps. We come to Israel. And miracle after miracle after miracle happens to us. Whether it's being triumphant, winning the victorious in the Milchamet HaShichurur in the War of Independence and the Six-Day War and bringing so many, uh, doubling our population in 20 years and the economic miracle of Israel. Today, the Shekel is one of the strongest, I hate to say it, but you know, the, you can picture the, the shekel, he's just in a ring with the dollar and pummeling the dollar. <laughs> and the dollar falling close to, from um, by 20, almost 25%, close to four, now it's close to three, and the shekel against the shekel, it, it, this is unbelievable. And so many different miracles, the, the, um, the, rescue of our people right in uh, in uganda and the bombing of the iraqi nuclear reactor i mean the the ability to build a spacecraft to go to the moon it, it's one after the other i think this is hashem's way of saying just a short time ago you may have been you know at the at, at the depths of your despair Will Judaism, will the Jewish people ever recover from the Shoah? But time and time again, Hashem builds up our confidence and self-esteem and says, look at the miracles. Do you recognize all the things that I'm doing for you so that you can look in the mirror and say, wow, 
God must really love me in order to do these things that make the whole world stand on its toes and say, wow, I have to see these people. And, you know, there are so many miracles to catalog. I think 10 is a, is a small number. If we just look back at the short history of Israel and all the miraculous things that Hashem has done and is continuing to do for us and to lift our spirits to say, you are as far from the death camps as you could be. You are indeed this princely nation that merits the intervention of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so I think that, that this is the 10-step the program in a sense that Hashem is doing. Yes, it has its impact on Egypt. Yes, it has its impact on the world. But most of all, I think it's being done for us by God in order to drum into us, into our neshamot, what a unique people we are. Because only when we believe in ourselves can we accomplish everything that Hashem expects us to accomplish. And therefore, this is all done. It's a chasdei Hashem, this 10-step program that we are experiencing ourselves, maybe before our very eyes without even realizing it. So I want to um, uh, again come back and um, to acknowledge um, the people who came before us and the when you meet, and all of us know when you meet Nitzalei Shawa, uh, they are inspirational in terms of what they accomplished against all odds, wherever they went, um, to America, to, to, to virtually every country, and especially to Israel. And uh, therefore, I, I, I wanted to uh, close, um, if you'll indulge me, um, just in, in, in memory of my mother-in-law, um, I wanted to, if I can get this to work, um, I wanted to play one of her favorite songs. Um, and it became, Susie knows, really one of my favorite songs. On occasion, I would even be able to dance with her. She was a great dancer. She loved to sing and um, full of life. And this really was her favorite song. If I can get it to play and you can listen to a little bit of it just for a, just for a couple of minutes. Um, it's the Hungarian Chardash for those of you. And I think for those who love music, it is my favorite violin piece. Although there are so many, Gila's shaking her head um, and musicians just know this is by um, one of the uh, Hungarian National Orchestra uh, playing this song. can see this. Are you hearing it? Can you hear it? Can't hear it. Uh, yeah. Stuart, you can, Stuart, you can share the screen and do it through your computer. Next if you time. go onto YouTube, you can share the screen with everyone. Stuart, what's the name of the song again? Hungarian Chardos, maybe. Can't hear it. Put the phone next to the screen. I'll tell you about it in a second. Hang on.
I can hear it here in New York. It helps if you put it next to the screen. I wonder how you could dance that with her. Don't hear it. Okay, I don't know if you were able to hear it all, I'm sorry. Um, no, not at all. Not at all. So nobody yeah. got, did anybody hear it? Yeah. Some people are saying yeah. they had yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. What, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you'd like, then I'll try to maybe fix it for next time, but YouTube Hungarian Chardash, and uh, it what? is a very inspirational and uh, just a beautiful song. So something that uh, really brings back great memories. So anyways, um, I, I wish all of you, I saw there were a couple of questions there. Um, yeah, but I think our time is up. I'm happy that everybody tuned in and uh, we should all experience uh, the Saroto vote, Yeshuot V'nechamot, only good tidings. And um, we should, and to Susie, she should emerge from the Shiva only to uh, the Soroto vote and Shani Pagesh Rak Bismachot. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, to all of you for tuning in. And next week, 6.15, I will send, oh, it'll be in the Parsha sheet. I'll try to send reminders, but we'll be a bit later so we can accommodate Mincha Marv. 6.15. Susie sending love. Next week. All the best, everybody. Can you say the second thing? Sending love. Susie what? Speak to you Char tomorrow. Chardash. Chardash. C H A R D A S H. But you can always write Thank separately you. if you have a question. C -Z. C -Z. It's C Z A R D A. -S. Okay, it's spelled different ways, but uh, it, it's spelled different ways. But uh, in, in Hungarian, it's spelled it's spelled differently. So <laughs> my Hungarian is very spotty. Susie speaks <laughs> none, and I speak none. Do you know that if you're a Jew in Vienna and you're not Hungarian, you're not Jewish? Okay. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> anyway, it's a very inspirational uh -huh. song. And you've heard it before. It's played at a lot of weddings because it really is, you know, the, the classic violin piece that in Eastern Europe, many variations of it. This is the Hungarian Chardash. There actually are a number of different... Uh, variations, as I said, on the Chardash. In any case, um, it should be uplifting. And this is something which, again, is such an amazing thing to recognize how Holocaust survivors were able to raise themselves up and to become leading citizens everywhere. After what they went through, it's really nothing short of miraculous. So again, um, wishing everybody here a good tidings, a good second shot when you get it, and hopefully uh, an end to the pandemic. And we should all meet together actually in person, although it's lovely being together on Zoom. All the best. Shabbat Shalom.